All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Astro Chats. I'm your Youth Astronaut Community Coordinator and host for Astro Chats. Uh, we're glad to have you with us again. Uh, before we get started, a quick reminder for those of you out there in our audience, you can join in on the conversation today uh, using Twitter or Facebook using the hashtag Astro Chat. I'll be monitoring both throughout our conversation. Also, which happens when I'm looking away, I'm looking for your questions. Uh, and we'd love for you to be part of this. So ask away and I'll ask them to our special guest. Speaking of which, uh, today we'll be talking about using the stars to guide our way or better known as celestial navigation. Uh, and today we have with us to talk about that, Max Mulhern. Thanks for joining us, Max. Hi, thanks for asking me to participate. We're Good excited to have you. Uh, this is kind of a fun topic for us. We've been talking a lot about kind of what happens when stars explode, black holes, things like this. This is bringing things a little bit more down to earth. We've had a few different ways to bring things back to those of us here planted on the ground. And I think this is a fun expedition into that. Um, so I thought maybe we'd start with what got you into celestial navigation? What got me into celestial navigation? That's a great question. Um, I have to, I think about that often because it was not a straight path, it was a kind of circuitous path. Uh, so basically, um, celestial navigation is used by uh, sailors. Uh, it was originally uh, uh, invented for sailors and cartographers to uh, sail the great seas of the, the, the earth and to actually make charts and maps of where they had been. Um, and so I uh, sailed all of my life. I grew up sailing on a place called the Chesapeake Bay, uh, which is you know, between Maryland and Delaware and Virginia. And then uh, as I got older, I started sailing more in the Atlantic Ocean and over in Europe uh, on the, um, in the English Channel and whatnot. And, and celestial navigation is still very much alive. And it was always something that sailors used despite the fact that uh, navigation was becoming more and more electronic. And the idea was that you could have all these fancy chart plotters that showed you where you were at any given time and what the dangers were that were surrounding you. But the caveat was that all of this could break down at any moment because it was depending on uh, a source of electricity out at sea. And as you probably know, <laughs> not necessarily, water and electricity don't mix. No. Or to say electronic devices like your computer or your telephone don't like water. Yeah. So you're out there with these very sophisticated um, electronic devices, but that are at the, always uh, subject to the, the water problem and the humidity problem. So celestial navigation was taught as uh, a means to be able to still find your way if everything electronic on your boat broke down. Great. So still kind of a backup, but I think for you, it's even more than that, right? Well, my, I, have a, I have some personal theories uh, about this based on experience. Um, I think I've noticed, well, here's a good example. When I was, I'm a professional skipper and I had to pass the celestial navigation test in order to become a professional skipper. And that test included making a 1000 mile passage of at least, uh, being at least 200 miles from land. And the idea being that if something happens, you wouldn't be able to just sail into a harbor. You had to figure out how to get to where you were going or to get to a safe haven or something like that. And while I was doing this on board the boat, the skipper of the boat at the time, because I was just a navigator passing my test, it's a five day test, um, was glued to his iPad. And with, all he was doing was looking at um, where we were and where we were going, and he wasn't noticing anything about the surroundings. So I was computer free, screen free. And one morning I woke up and the sky was just a horrid color. It's like the sign of very bad weather to come. Mm. And I mentioned this to the skipper, but he was like on his iPad saying, well, the information on the iPad says fair winds, not a problem. And I was like, well, we should watch out because that was a very nasty sky. And even though it's a very sunny day, it's a pretty breeze, the ocean is calm, we're in for something. It's like, oh, whatever. I, my iPad says the contrary. And lo and behold, six hours later, we were hit with a massive storm. Mm. And had I been the person 
uh, the navigator sitting below with my screen, I would have never seen any of this come. But the fact that I wasn't on a screen and had to do my go out stores, out on the deck, look at the sky to get my sights from the sun, a sight from the sun. When I say sight, I mean like when you're doing a celestial navigation, you're always looking at celestial bodies in the sky. When I would go out on deck to look at a celestial body, it's usually the sun. I was also taking note of my surroundings. Okay. If you're, if you're in uh, doing your navigation electronically, you can literally cross oceans in a box and know where you are because you're just looking with the screen. And in fact, in the military, in the Navy, uh, a lot of people spend their times in dark rooms looking at screens. There's, they're not on the deck, you know, taking care of things. And um, it's interesting to note that the Navy discontinued teaching celestial navigation at the uh, Naval Academy in Annapolis in around 2002. And just two years ago, they reinstated the teaching of celestial navigation because you realize that the GPS system that we all depend on is extremely easy to jam and to, and to uh, interfere with. So they realize that it's, we're too vulnerable if we depend on GPS. That's really interesting. And I, yeah, I think that's a good point is it's good to know where all this information comes from so that you're capable yourself without that, in, without that technology. The technology is great, super useful, makes things easier, but it's nice to be know that you can depend on yourself to do these things. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this morning you brought with us, you brought with you some things to show us, maybe not on screen, but actually in person, um, speaking of. Oh, yes. Well, um, so I've had the pleasure to work with Erica before um, uh, at the Center for Astrophysics when we do, was it Science for Cambridge? Um, well, yes. Right, in the summer. And so my speciality, I've only done it once, but I had a, a stand and my speciality was to create one of these. Now, um, you can probably tell what's going on here. We've got, we've got a protractor and we have the hole in the protractor and we've made sort of a lever here with string and two little nuts and we put a straw up here. And what we can do is you can imagine looking at through this end of the straw up into the sky here, we can measure what the angle is of a body in the sky, okay? And so I can say, if I'm looking at a, for example, this is perfectly level right now. So that would mean that I, if I were looking at the sun, I wouldn't look at the sun directly through here. I would look at the shadow of the sun that's projected onto my hand. I can't do it here because I don't have a sunny day. The sun would be, where do you think the sun would be? Take, a, take, take 10 minutes, take 10 seconds to think about if I could see the light of the sun through the straw with the protractor in this position, where do you think the sun would be? I'll give our audience out there a second to think about it too. And maybe somebody will post online, but if not, I'll give my answer. Well, my guess is it would have to be on the other end of the straw. Right. It'd have to be on the other end of the straw, but also what, let's put it, okay, I'll ask you a question the other way. What time of day would it be if, if, I, if I could see the shadow of the sun uh, on my hand here, and this was pointed at the sun. It would have to be either the beginning or end of the day, because it would be very low and then in the exactly. sky. This basically, this is right now, this straw, as you can see on the, the little line between my ceiling and the, the wall, for example, this, this straw is perfectly horizontal. And so you'd be seeing the sun either in, at dawn or at dusk, at sunrise or at sunset. And then as the sun goes up, into the sky during the day, it would be get higher and higher. And then maybe at noon, it might be about this high. Okay. Wait a second. Yeah. Let's pause there for a second because I think a lot of people are gonna be suspicious of what you just said. That at okay. noon, the sky's not, that you wouldn't have it straight up and down. They might be, that's something to consider. So let's say this is sunrise, okay, and the sun is going up in the sky. How far, how, how far up does it go? Does it go this high? Does it go that high? Does it go that high? Yeah, I think most, a lot of people, when they think about it, think that the sun goes straight up ahead at noon, right? That's, it's high noon, right? Right high up over noon. the head. Okay, but I, well, 
The only thing I can suggest, because um, one thing I've been taught to do at the CFA is not to answer questions that you can answer. So what I would suggest, I think these materials are pretty easy to find at home, okay? You might be able to get that protractor out of your geometry uh, kit or your trigonometry kit. You could probably get a piece of string. You can get, you can get some nuts here. You can get a fishing weight. Um, you can hang any kind of heavy object off of this and you can get a straw and tape it onto the top of this. And then you can look, you can observe what the sun is doing. Let's be very careful here. Never look at the sun directly, okay? You wanna find the shadow of the sun on the palm of your hand by lining the, con the protractor up with your hand. I'm sorry we can't see it here because there's no sun. Okay, but you wanna get the reflection of, you wanna basically have the sun going directly through the straw and onto your hand. And once it's doing that, you can clasp the string and you can read, you can read what the string is telling you. Okay, so here, we call this altitude, the altitude of a body in the sky, which you may have heard about if you've been studying uh, astronomy. Here, the altitude is zero, okay? The, 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 the sun is directly on the horizon. This would be an altitude of about 45, and this would be an altitude of 90, okay? So what you do is you count your units from here, at this part here, okay? So uh, this would be like an altitude of 20 degrees right there. All right. What you can do is you can look at the look at the sun indirectly with this through looking in your hand throughout the day and see how high the sun gets. When does it go overhead? Good question. It's a great question, and I think that's a great thing for our audience to go try for themselves. Yeah. If I'll just give you some different points of view of this, okay? You can get you can get these at a. Uh, probably better to order these online right now, given the, the virus, but they're pretty easy to find online. You might have this stuff laying around, like I said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of people, your middle school classes require protractors like that a lot of times. Right. So you've, I don't know um, if your students have been looking at the history of astronomy, but the, um, some of the biggest, um, some of the biggest, when we first started observing the sky, we started using instruments this simple which gave us an enormous amount of information concerning what could possibly be going on in the sky. Yeah, that's, that's incredible that something so simple could yes. tell us so much about the night sky. Exactly. So this is, based, this is the instrument that is at the base of all the fancy instruments we use in celestial navigation. Because we do use some very fancy um, instruments, and I can show you one. We use boats, which are fancy instruments. <laughs> um, we, we use, now, what I'm about to show you, <clears throat> I won, uh, I won a, a famous ocean race a few years ago, and they gave this as one of the prizes. And what I'm about to show you is, is well, let's see, I'll show it to you. Let's see if you can guess what it is. Oh, I don't know. This, this moves back and forth like this. And this, this is a telescope. This is a telescope here. So you look through here. So it's kind and, of pieces like what you were just showing us. Right, it's like I have, I, there's a viewing angle and then you have this to measure, to measure the altitude of the body you're looking at. Okay, this is a very, very cheap um, reproduction of a very sophisticated instrument called a sextant, okay? And even though this is not the case, this is called a sextant because this is supposed to show one, one sixth of a circle, mm. okay? And what happens is through a complex, it's hard, a complex uh, game of mirrors here, we have in filters, we have the sun hit this mirror here, come down to this mirror here, and then, yes, hold on, there you go. It hits this mirror here, hits this mirror here, and then comes into this telescope. Oh. And you're gonna say, well, Max, you told us not to look at the sun. And I say, you're right. 
But what we have are fancy filters that come down uh -huh. to block the, the, the sun, Avant, to filter the sun. You can still see the sun through the filters, but it won't hurt your eyes. Okay, so we have these filters that can come in front of the mirrors. Okay, while well, you're measuring the angle of the sun. So you or can whatever, it can be a star, it can, a star, it can be the moon, it can be a planet, it can be the space station. It can be the International Space Station if you know where it is. Because um, the important thing here about celestial navigation to keep in mind is we depend on uh, accumulation of a lot of knowledge that's been, uh, uh, that's been uh, harvested from the skies over millennia. And what that means is that we know where the bodies are in the sky when we look at them. This is the secret to celestial navigation. There's no mystery as to where the bodies are in the sky when we're looking at them. And the whole thing about celestial navigation is to know where we are in relation to those bodies at any given time. But that at any given time, we know where those bodies are. And by looking at the angles they are from us, their altitude, we can figure out where we are on the planet. So this is, a, this is a funny little reproduction that's just a prize, but a, a more serious, well, first of all, I've actually navigated in the ocean with something this, this simple. Really? That simple? This simple. What happened was I actually used it during this race. Um, it, there was no wind in the sea. We were in the middle of the ocean, about 200 miles from Bermuda, the sea was, is, calm, it was as flat as your computer screen. So I was able to look at, it was the morning site, and I was able to look at Venus and a star, I believe, to get my bearings. My la they were my last bearings before this final sprint to Bermuda. And I was able to use this instrument because my sextant had been giving me problems throughout the entire trip. And the reason we don't use these at, on the sea is that this pendulum that we're using to measure angles if you're in a seaway, it's moving too much. Yeah. We're on a boat and this is moving all over the place and um, we can't measure with it. And it's the same problem we have with keeping time at sea. Like before, when clocks were invented, they used pendulums, but you couldn't take a pendulum to sea because it would move around like this and the clock will stop taking, uh, keeping time. So one of the big steps in doing celestial navigation was getting rid of the pendulum. But on a perfectly flat sea, you can use this. What happened with the sextant was that we had to isolate the pendulum so that even if the boat were moving around, what, let me get rid of this. Even if the boat were moving around, look at this piece here in relation to the angles here. Even if the boat was moving around, mm. not moving. Yeah. So I can take a measurement of the sky and, and a precise measurement of the sky, no matter how much the ship is moving, because this this is this uh, locks. Okay. So that's one of the, you know pendulums, as you probably study in your your physics classes, you know uh, basic physics. You'll look at a lot of pendulums and learn a lot about. Um, you'll learn a lot of physics with uh, pendulums, and they were what powered. Well, they didn't power. They were what helped um, make clocks keep time, but we couldn't take them to sea. We had to somehow make the pendulum become a different, something else inside of clocks that we could take to see, which is a whole nother history. And does the time of day matter when you're doing celestial navigation? The time of day always matters because basically the mariner's best friend are his, sext are his sextant and his or her sextant or his or hers watch. This is one of my best friends. So <laughs> because everything, everything depends on time. Because what happens is that when you look at the sky, you have to know what time it is precisely in order to know where the body is in the sky precisely. So that when you measure your altitude from that body, you know how far, you know where that body is exactly and how far away you are from it. Okay? Because without going into too much, um, too much calculation. The altitude of a body tells you how far away you are from 
uh, the place that that body is over the earth. Okay, we call that the geographical position. Every single body in the, in the sky is somewhere over the earth. And so we know exactly where the sun is, for example. We know exactly where the sun is over the earth. We know what its latitude and longitude is. That's to say, we know if it's north or south of the equator. We know if it's east or west of Greenwich, for example. And I can explain these, if, uh, these terms if anyone has any questions. But we, we know at every minute of the day exactly over what part of the earth the sun is. And when I measure my out the altitude to the sun, I know where I am, what my geographical position is in relation to the sun's geographical position. And after that, it's just triangles, beautiful triangles. <laughs> so that geometry is important. Geometry is very, very important. It's called triangulation. I don't know if you have, has anyone ever heard that term, triangulation? I don't know. We'll see if anybody has to, anything to comment on that out there okay. in the Twitter sphere. Um, so I'm going to go back to the sun for a second, because you said you know exactly where it is above the earth. And so one thing I'm going to maybe tell our young people out there is if they're at different places on the earth mm -hmm. and they're taking that noon time measurement or when it's the highest in the sky, which may not be noon, you'll have to let us know that they might get different numbers depending on where they are out there in the globe. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. We all... It's interesting the perspectives that you'll get um, when you are looking at the sun with somebody else who's not where you are. Um, they will see the sun very differently. So an example might be, what would be a good example? Take a flagpole, for example, and imagine that you draw a big circle around the flagpole and you put your friends all along that circle. And you could even, you could talk to each other because you're close enough or use little walkie talkies. And you could all, uh, you would all have a different description of what, you're, of what you're seeing on the background of that flagpole from where you're standing. Okay, so that flagpole is standing in the middle of a schoolyard. Some people might see the school behind the flagpole. Some people might see a parking lot behind the flagpole. Some people might see some houses behind the flagpole. Everyone's gonna have a different perspective of what's behind the flagpole, okay? So, so already see that, that gives you an idea that people are gonna start seeing things differently according to their relative position to, to the flagpole, okay? And when you're looking at the flagpole from anywhere along that circle, you'll be seeing different things behind it, which means you'll probably also have, you, you will also have, be looking at the flagpole in different directions. That's to say, if you have a compass, and you're all standing in a circle looking at the same flagpole and you're all standing on the same circle. Everyone who's holding a compass and pointing it at the flagpole will see the flag facing a different direction, flagpole facing a different direction, okay? So you're all basically, you're kind of in the same place but you can set up the situation where you're all looking at the flagpole at different angles, at different directions. But what's funny, is that you'll all be standing on this circle that is equidistant from the flagpole, imagine. So even if someone is standing on this circle and there's someone totally opposite them on the other side of the circle, and they'll be looking at the flagpole facing different directions. I might be looking at it as it's facing, and I'm facing south while I look at it. The other person might be looking at it facing north. But we'll all see the flagpole at the same, the top of the flagpole, we'll all see it at the same altitude. Oh, because we're all the same distance. So if we all, because we're all the same distance from the center of the flagpole, we make a circle around it, we'll all be able to hold our protractor and see the flagpole at the same angle. Interesting. So this is why it's very important there are, there are a lot of, when you're looking at the sun, it's very important to know what direction you're, look, you're facing when you're looking at the sun, okay? And this gives you an idea of where you, uh, this gives a navigator a very quick idea of where they are in relation to the, the sun. Uh, if they know where the sun is, then they know where they are in relation to where the sun is. And so without even very tricky instruments like a sextant, you can use something basic like this with a compass and, and have an idea of what sector you're in in relation to the sun. So if the sun is on the equator, 
and I looking at it and I see it facing south, south of me, I know I'm to the north of the sun, I'm in the northern hemisphere. If someone sees it, is looking at it and it's facing north, so they're south of the sun, then they know they're in the southern hemisphere. But I won't say any more because this requires drawings and some actual going out with a compass into the great world and seeing this for yourself. It's a little abstract. <laughs> so go try it out. But I think that's a great simple thing to start thinking about. What direction are you facing when you're looking at these things in the sky? And that helps you understand where you are. And particularly yeah. the sun is an easy one that I think all of us could try out ourselves and start to get an idea about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, find a flagpole. It's a very, it's very instructive because if you imagine the top of the flagpoles being the sun, and that pole going down to the earth, and that defines the geographical position of the sun, then you can figure out where you are in relation to that that flagpole. You can figure out your geographical position in relation to the geographical position of the flagpole, i.e., the sun. Very cool. So my guess is that at this point, there's a lot of objects that celestial navigators can use, right? It's not just the sun. But if you have to know where things are, there must be a third item that navigators need. Something that tells you all of that information mm -hmm. about the objects. Because one thing we've started to talk a little bit is that the objects do move, particularly those in our solar system, even things farther as we move, well, they don't move. I should clarify, we move and our perspective of them moves in the night sky. So at, as we move around our solar system, uh -huh. the way we see perhaps some of the other planets in our solar system changes. So there must be a third thing you all need. Well, you brought up two interesting things. There is a third thing we all need and uh, that is called an almanac. And an almanac is a wonderful thing because it will tell you uh, exactly where the sun is at every second of the day. Wow. Right. And let me see if I have one because what happens is they come out, there's a new almanac every year because um, the way as we're, as we're hurtling around our orbit around the sun, um, things change just a little bit every year. And so we have to recalibrate well, we don't recalibrate anything, but we have to make sure that the almanac is uh, readjusted for uh, the position of all the heavenly bodies every year. Um, because that changes. Uh, as you probably may know, that's, you know, a year, as we count up on Earth, is not quite 365 days. So when we start to try and calibrate all that and make sense of it, we have, to make, uh, we have to make small adjustments in our calculations, but the almanac lets you know exactly um, where, where things are from year to year. And if you'll just excuse me for a minute, let me see if I have a copy, because the problem is we tend to like get rid of these after we've used them. Absolutely, because they're not useful in future years. So I'll just make a clarifying while you do that to our audience. Um, when he says a year is not what we think of as 365, 365 days is that 365 days is how we count a year, but for the earth to come back to exactly the same place it was com compared to the sun in our solar system is not exactly 365 days. It takes a little bit longer than that, uh, which is why we have leap years and things like that to make some of those adjustments, but it's not perfect in the way we count. So we have to make those adjustments. And now he's got a book. So I've written all over this because this is a very special year for me for other reasons. But um, so this is this is issued every year um, by the by the United Kingdom Hydrographic Office. Okay. Right. So this book, I have to confess, is absolutely daunting when you first see it. <laughs> I'll give you a. And I'll show you why. That is a lot of lines that look like they have a lot of numbers in it. Exactly. Uh, yeah, that is a daunting book when you first see it. And not only that, but there are, um, for example, 
what else can I show you? There's some more different forms of numbers. <laughs> wow. And then there are diagrams. Those are confusing looking diagrams, I'm gonna be honest. Yes, they're confusing. And then there's some other very cool diagrams, but if you don't know what you're looking at are indecipherable. <laughs> uh, but, but like most things, practice makes perfect. And when you start to know what these are talking about, you start to see the sky. This is basically is a book of the sky. And I like to call this book, the book of motion, because you can literally, if you find the right column, you can run your finger, you can run your finger down some of these columns and actually see how the sun is moving. You will, you will be able to see it going around the earth. And this brings up, you might say to yourself, what I'm, a, I'm just gonna re phrase that. <laughs> oh, no, don't, because I think there's something I just said that should be shocking to you. I said, you can watch the sun go around the earth. Yeah, the sun doesn't go around the earth. It doesn't, but for navigators, it does. What navigators do, and it's very interesting, is that we know that the Earth is orbiting the sun. But for navigational purposes, we are interested on, in the path of the sun across the Earth's surface. So for us, for, we actually flip things back the other way to um, a Ptolemaic system where we actually are becoming, we're using a geocentric mindset to do our celestial navigation. Okay, so even though we all know the earth is going around the sun, not the other way around. Exactly. When we look up, it appears like the sun's going around the earth, right? Things look like they move compared to us. And that using that perspective is easier, is what you're saying for navigation. Exactly, we, 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 it's the model, it is a model that works the best for us to do what we wanna do. So it's not a model that's saying this is the truth. It's just a model that gets us to a truth we're looking for, which is what is my position on the earth? What is my latitude? What is my longitude? And latitude, just, just a quick lesson, latitude is your, your, your distance basically north or south of the equator. Yes, okay. the way I've always remembered that, latitude is like the ladders, the rungs on a ladder. That's a, that's a great mnemonic. That's good. Good device. And how, how, how do you remember longitude? What's that? It's the other one. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Yeah, it's the other one. If that measures east-west. Um, so those are the lines if you're looking at a globe that go from the North Pole to the South Pole. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, so we have that very curious mindset when we're doing celestial navigation, which is to imagine that the sun is actually circling around us. Of course it's not. But what I like to ask my students to think about um, is how do we know that the earth is orbiting the sun? Mm. That's to say, in the beginning of the program, I asked you to go out and observe the sun using the sun's shadow with this object here to, figure, to see what the sun appears to be doing in the sky. But a question you could ask yourself when you're doing that is, where is the proof that we are orbiting the sun? How, where can I see that we are orbiting the sun when I'm looking at the sun? Can you give our young audience a hint at that one? And, and so uh, I, I would love to, but what's really interesting is that you are being, it's interesting, we don't often ask people to prove things that are being, that we're being taught. So what's interesting about this ground level astronomy that we're doing, that's to say, I, I like to say I'm doing practical astronomy or applied astronomy. That's to say, it, I'm fascinated by the formation of stars and, and, uh, and neutron stars and gravitational waves and black holes. 
they're not really part of the toolkit when you're doing celestial navigation. Mm. Uh, and, but we're doing, we're looking at things really only that we can see with the naked eye, basically with a little bit of help from very weak telescopes. What's important for us is the, 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 the geometry be between what's going, what are the angles between me and this body I'm looking at? But one of the big questions that comes up um, if you start thinking about it, it's like, yes, well, we're told that certain things are going on up in the sky, but it's not looking at the sky that you necessarily understand that, that you necessarily reach that conclusion. So even when you're standing on the earth, you can still ask yourself some pretty profound questions about the sky without any fancy instruments. I agree. So that this is, this is, this is, the celestial navigation is a great gateway into astronomy, but it's also a great gateway into looking at how humans have understood or tried to understand the sky for thousands of years and how the sky does not necessarily, necessarily reveal how it works. You, you have to figure out a way to make it tell you how it works. And this is the basic, this is what science is. is how do you make nature tell you about herself, her true self? Because just looking at it will not necessarily give you the answers. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think, um, yeah, looking at it, you need other ways to look at it and other things to start understanding it. But mm -hmm. don't stop looking. <laughs> no, 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 you have to, no, but you, you can, it's, it's the looking, but it's also the asking of questions. Mm asking you questions and it's like oh okay you know i, I i'm flip-flopping here between a geocentric view of the world that's to say the sun is going around me and the fact that i know that we're actually orbiting the sun but i've flip-flopping for for practical purposes but i've never really proven to myself that we are actually orbiting the sun And this is very important for you when you're, when you're a child, when you're a student in school, you're being told a lot of things and that are being taken for granted as being truths. And I'm not saying to, to question whether or not that those things are true. I'm just saying that it's interesting to know how much work was involved in um, finding the truth because the truth felt like it could go in two different directions. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'll point, make another point to this and something we've talked about in some previous chats here is that um, oftentimes in school, the science you're learning, somebody already else knows, right? That That's the science in school is science that's been discovered already. Um, and by going through that same process, some of those similar processes, you're getting to practice some of the skills involved in answering questions so that once you have this body of knowledge inside your brain, all of these things that other people have discovered, you can start asking your own questions uh, that are even more complicated. You're building on the answers that others have uh, discovered for themselves. And so following along their footsteps, um, often I remember even when I was in school being like, why am I doing this? Somebody already knows the answer. Why are you making me do this? Somebody knows the answer. Uh, and part of the reason you're we're doing that is to understand how they know the answer, right? The process of coming up with that answer, because it can seem really obvious just today, but you just made a really good point that, yeah, we all know the earth goes around the sun. It seems obvious, but when you look up and you observe the sun, it's not that obvious. Um, so there's a lot of things, questions you have to ask yourself to come up with those answers. And that practice is really good if you're interested in science and uh, the future of science and getting to a point where you're asking your own questions that no one else has asked before. And you can start asking those questions today, then it's a process of figuring out the answers. So I think that's a really good point. Thanks, Max. Exactly. So this is, so we, you were wondering, um, you know, I, I work at the, the CFA, the Center for Astrophysics, um, but I do something very niche. Well, everyone's working on something very specific at the C CFA that's, uh, it's um, uh, highly specific, but um, when I'm teaching the celestial navigation, I'm really in at the entry level of, of astrophysics in that I'm, I'm not even doing astrophysics, I'm not doing physics, and I'm doing very 
um, basic astronomy, but I am addressing the problems that Erica was just bringing up, which is that, you know, it's it, the scientific process is like, how do you get to the information that we have is a very interesting path to follow. And, and these questions ask themselves when you're doing things like celestial navigation. So when you're using the stars to figure out if you're close to some rocks or just in the middle of the ocean and not near any kind of rocks, um, uh, you're, you're also opening the door to these other bigger questions, which, which as curious people, as humans that are curious like this, we will have to you know, address at one point or another. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see that you know, big questions can be asked at the very, at the ground level, at the entrance level to, to, to astronomy. I think that's a great point. Um, can we maybe, if our young audience happens to live somewhere with decently dark skies, what are some other things that they might, celestial bodies or objects that they might want to look at? Well, the one we like to look at, which is lots of fun because it's, um, it's, it's tricky, it likes to play tricks on us, is the moon. Ooh, plays tricks on us. How does the moon play tricks on us? Well, a good way to compare the, the moon, to understand the moon is to compare it to the sun. So for example, if you are an early riser, <laughs> I don't know if we're gonna have many early risers here in that group. I don't, a lot of middle schoolers gotta get up pretty early. They may not want to get up early, but they have to get up pretty early. Right. Oh, well, what you can do is, um, early risers or, or, you can, or if you can see sunsets, you know, you can, you can get a, a notebook. Um, journals are a very, very important part of science and they're a very important part of uh, astronomy and celestial navigation. Um, and you can start making drawings of what these bodies are doing when they're just on the horizon, let's say rising or setting. And you can start to see over a very small, just over a few weeks, you can start to see some patterns of what these bodies appear to be doing when they're on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that um, they are relatively consistent throughout the year. There, 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 there are changes that are taking place, but they're not sudden and abrupt. They're gradual, okay? And I would leave that to you to, to look at with uh, using one of these. And if you wanna keep a journal, of like just what sunsets or sunrises are doing for a month, you'll, you'll find some very interesting information. Um, but then if you try to do that with the moon, you will find that the patterns are much more difficult to establish. The moon is going to change its habits, as it were, much faster than the sun. And so one of the things you need to do is try to find the moon. So you need to ask yourself, well, when's a good time to look for the moon? Which is already a very big question. Oh, you froze there for a oh, second. Do we see the moon only at night? Oh, I'm sorry. You froze there for a second. So I'm gonna so, ask you to start that again because I don't want our audience to miss it. Oh, I, I don't, uh, so I, I guess I was saying that the moon is not, you know, the sun is pretty predictable uh, over the course of a month, but the moon is, is much, is predictable once you know what it's doing, but in the beginning, the patterns will seem like, they'll seem inexistent. This moon will appear to not have any consistency whatsoever. And the word lunatic, if you're familiar with that word, it means somebody who's kind of all over the place and, and distracted and mad. Um, comes from the word lun, uh, L-U-N, which is how the, uh, is the Latin word for moon. And um, when you, the, the moon will kind of drive you crazy when you try to figure out what it's doing in the beginning because it feels like it's unpredictable. It's just up there flying around in any old fashion. But if you can find the moon, then what you need to do, once you've found it, then you need to try and um, line it up with something that, uh, you know, so like a tree or a telephone pole or a roof or something like that, and try to predict where that moon will be in relation to that telephone pole, for example, tomorrow at the same time. Mm. 
So whereas we know pretty much tomorrow at the same time, we'll see the sun rise or set or be at a certain position in the sky. That will be pretty, from day to day for a week, that will seem like it's not changing at all. Maybe just a tiny little bit, but pretty consistent. Tiny little bit. You'd have to use an instrument to measure it really, but it'll be super, it'll seem to be super consistent, okay? But the moon, once you line it up with something, then you've got to start, you're gonna be in for some big surprises. Mm. Okay, so try to, try to find a moon, line it up with something at a certain time of day, write down what time of day it was, make a little picture of the moon and the object you lined it up with, and think about where that moon will be tomorrow at the same time. I think that's another great activity and things you can do at home. Yes, through your window. Yeah, you don't, you don't even have to go outside. You don't have to go outside. <laughs> well, as long as your windows face the right direction. Well, I mean, a window is interesting because you'll have, if you look through a window, you have a pretty big arc of, uh, you have a pretty big arc of uh, viewing, right? Yeah. It's not quite 180 degrees, but I would say I have a good, uh, you get a good 100, 110 degrees, even more if your nose is right up against the window. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now the problem might be if you have a skyscraper in front of you, um, I don't, so I can see the sky pretty well, but some people like imagine if you're living in New York City or, or Dubai with uh, those amazingly tall buildings, um, you might not be able to see the sky at all. Uh, yeah. So you'll have to maybe, that's the front of the apartment, you might have to go to the back. But anyway, yeah, so you need to have access to the sky, which is not a given. And also, yeah, um, some people in big cities have, you know, the light pollution, um, but uh, if you look at the sky long enough, uh, you can often see, even in heavily lit cities, you can often see the stars. And certainly the moon. The moon has never been, never been obliterated by uh, light pollution. So that is something that is available to all of us out there. Well. Well. That is, a, the, that is something that is available to all of us, but once again, that moon and even the sun sometimes to certain people are not available. That is true. Depends where you are on the earth. That is very true. One of the things we like to do in order to understand what's going on up in the sky is to ask people to think about things in terms of what would you, how would, how would this look at the equator? How would this look at the North or South Pole? Mm -hmm. and it's, it's a good technique, a scientific technique. You just take the extremes Okay, and then you can find out where it, what's happening for you somewhere in between those extremes. Mm -hmm. Which comes up, there's this word I love, which is called interpolate. That's a big word. That is a big word. That is a big word. But it's really fun to take this word apart because it's made up of two words. Well, actually a prefix and then the main words is inter, which is between, polate, the word poles is in the word polate. So I like to think of interpolate as like between poles, between extremes. So when we have extremes, we can interpolate for where we are in between the two extremes. So we can guess is the simplest word there, but we're not guessing because it's not just out of nowhere, but we can use that information to make a, a, an idea of what might be happening in the middle. Sure. Somewhere. It's like in between those two extremes, we, we're we somewhere between the two extremes, between the two poles of possibility. And so one thing I am going to offer another activity for our audience out there, just to kind of get an idea when you're talking about things can look different from different places. And obviously right now we can't go running off to different places, um, but our we have our micro observatory telescopes, uh, which is something that takes images of the night sky. And we actually have a telescope in Chile and telescopes in Arizona and Cambridge. So you can actually see how things might look differently compared from the Northern hemisphere to the Southern hemisphere and the moon being a really great one to look at. Uh, so if you take a picture of moon, uh, you can go to the image archive at microobservatory.org and look at the moon taken from the telescopes in Chile and the telescopes in either Cambridge or Arizona and see if you can see some differences and how how that might appear different in the night sky. To someone. Mm -hmm. So just another way to kind of start getting this idea that, and for you to get your own personal perspective on this, that things might look different from different places on the earth. Exactly. 
All so right. That's a really great perspective that we have these days, thanks to um, GPS and, and internet and things like that. Um, we have, uh, we, when we're at the uh, Center for Astrophysics, um, we have a very specific way of, we're at our longitude and latitude, so we see uh, the sky only from that possible position. But what's great is during the breaks, like a spring break or a Thanksgiving break, people can go away to all across the world to, to their homes for Thanksgiving, for example, and they start to see different skies and they can start to see those, make those comparisons. Yeah, yeah, just, just with your own eyes, start to make those comparisons. Yeah, so what, what you can do is if you are, uh, you can always call your grandmother or your grandfather or, or another member of the family, a brother or sister that's grown up, moved away and ask them what they're seeing uh, in the sky when you're looking at the sky. And that's always a very fun, fun project. That's a great idea. You're coming up with all sorts of great projects for our, our audience to do. Things that you can do yourself that don't require all, this, all these big tools and equipment. Exactly. So we have about 10 more minutes here. Uh, and I just wanted to make sure I didn't, I gave you time if there was anything else you wanted to show us or tell us about today. Well, uh, two things, career path wise, um, I think what you need just, I, I came to this in a very uh, circuitous route. I was, um, uh, I did fine arts for a long time. I was uh, doing a lot of sculpture and drawing and, and things like that. Uh, but I always had this love of uh, sailing and navigation. And um, it's, uh, I felt myself being pulled towards the teaching of, of those skills. And uh, that's how I ended up uh, at the CFA. So um, you, you just never know where your passion can take you. And um, that's, that's, that's basically, yeah, I've just uh, been very much in touch with what I love and, and, and try to share that with, with, with others. So that, that was my path to CFA. I, I was an English lit major and art history major in, in college. And wow. I, went, I went to art school after that. So um, you, you can pursue those, those, those sort of subjects and still have um, a, a love and interest for science that will, uh, that you can, you can grow into later in, later on in life. So, and I think that's a good point too, that you can have other careers and still have a passion and a love for science and have that be part of who you are. I think oftentimes in society, we think, oh, people have passions for music and art that maybe aren't their career, but we forget that you can do the same thing with science, that you can have a passion for science that is not necessarily a career, or maybe one day be you wind your way back into it, but it doesn't have to, you can appreciate and be part of the science community, even if it's not the thing you want to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Exactly. So one last thing I could like to show you, and this, it was something I made at the uh, Center for Astrophysics in order to help teach um, our students how to look at the sky and get themselves orientated in the sky. And if, can I share this, uh, Erica and Max Chan? Oh, let me see. Like, oh, oh, sorry. I'll go back. Hold on. Here, hold on, just a second. I had it there, here we go. Is that, can you see, oh, it's still me, sorry. No, we can see. Oh, you can see the, you can see the Maxitron? Yeah. Okay, I wasn't seeing it. Okay, great, okay. So this was interesting because my, um, my ability to make sculptures and make objects enabled me to kind of collaborate with um, uh, a professor named Phil Sadler at the uh, science education department that's at the CFA. And we were able to create this, this sphere made up of... Oh no, you froze. Max, you're frozen. Sorry out there, guys. The internet, we're all on it right now. If I can let him know that he's frozen, I don't know that he knows. Oh, and the internet took us at the end. Well, unfortunately, I think we're gonna end that way. I'll see if he can get himself back on in a second just to 
so he can say goodbye. Um, and he can show you just a little bit, but that sphere is really cool. He uses it to help people learn about how to look at the night sky. Um, if he's able to join us, he can tell us a second more, but while we wait, um, we'll give him a minute. I'll let you know about tomorrow. Um, so tomorrow uh, we have, we'll be talking with Yvette Sendez, Dr. Yvette Sendez, about what happens when stars explode. Uh, we'll be doing that at 12 p.m. Eastern, so noon Eastern. Um, please join us. We'd love to see you all there and see your questions. And as always, if you have questions before or after one of our sessions, post them in advance. We'll try and answer them. I know I've got a question or two on Facebook from last Friday that I'm working on getting you an answer to. So post them there. You can always follow the chats uh, using the hashtag AstroChat and we're fo we'll follow up for you. Uh, might take us a day. Everybody's at home trying to deal with everything, but we'll get you those answers. Um, all right, it doesn't look like Max is going to be joining us again, but we'll give him one more second just in case he he's able to make it back on. Uh, and yeah, let us know what else you want to talk about in these Astro Chats. Am I not asking types of questions you want? Post them. Get your parents to post them on Twitter if you don't have a Twitter yourself. Uh, we want to hear from you. We want to make sure that this is something that you're enjoying as well. Uh, and so, unfortunately, I think that's our hour. I don't think we're going to get Max back to show us Maxitron, um, but maybe we'll get him to type something up for us in the future. Uh, thanks for joining us again today at uh, at these Astro Chats. Hopefully, we'll see you tomorrow and continue to see you throughout the coming weeks. Um, hopefully, we'll be adding a few more days to the end of our calendar. So keep up, uh, keep your eyes out for that. And we'll see you next time. Have a great day, guys. <laughs>